Good morning, everybody. Please stand and join together at singing At the Cross. Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to welcome you to our service of worship today at Grace United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us. If you are worshiping with us in person, we would like to invite you to take the tear-off section of your bulletin and complete it and drop it in the offering plate. Also note that there is a place on there where you can sign up for the fifth Sunday lunch, which is coming next week. So that would help us to get an idea of how many are coming while you're completing that um, tear-off section. If you're worshiping with us online, we'd love for you to leave us a comment or maybe share our worship service on your page so that others can worship with you. And while you're doing those things, there are um, a few announcements that I would like to draw to your attention. First, um, we closed our discernment period last Sunday, and the copies of the discernment team's report are available on the table in the atrium if you're interested in reading that. There's approximately 20, and if you 
Uh, if they are gone by the time you get there, I'll be glad to print you some more or even send it to you by email or snail mail, whichever is easy for you. Um, and as a result of that, the Administrative Council voted on Tuesday to hold a church conference, and we received that date Thursday afternoon after the bulletin was printed. So mark your calendar for Sunday, May 7th at 5.30 p.m. Sunday, May 7th at 5.30 p.m. And um, you will be receiving something in the mail this week with more details about that, which will contain a letter as well as the withdrawal agreements that we will be voting on. And so, um, so that will be, look for that in your mail to come out um, in the next couple of days. So um, I wanted to make you aware of that so you can mark your calendar for that. Also, you see that there are several mission needs for CCA. We do want to say a special thank you to all those who came to the work day yesterday. We got a lot done. We had a beautiful day. We appreciate um, you giving of your time and sweat to help make our church a more beautiful place. And uh, if you um, see some of those folks, be sure to tell them how much you noticed the difference that was made with some of the, the trimming and pruning and weeding and other things that were done. Also, the um, new upper rooms for May and June are available now, so we invite you to pick up your copy as you leave today. We know we're a couple of weeks away still, but that way you'll have it ready to go when May 1 rolls around. Also very important, um, I am going to do a four-week Bible study on the book of Jonah. Um, we're going to do it on Mondays. One, one session will be at 11 o'clock on Monday, then the other session will be at 5.30 on Monday, so uh, there's not a book. Just bring your Bible and bring a friend. Um, so we we are going to talk about the Old Testament book of Jonah, and it's only going to be for four weeks. So we'd love for you to join to join us for that, um, beginning Monday, May the first, I believe. So um, so mark that on your calendar. Also very important this week, um, Denise Baker has resigned her position as the administrative assistant at the church. Her last day will be Thursday, so we'd um, love for you to come by this week sometime from our office hours are 8.30 to 12.30, Monday through Thursday, just to tell her how much you appreciate her work and the 12 years that she has served as the administrative assistant here at Grace. So I wanted you to be aware of that. So we have lots going on in the life of our church. Are there other announcements that we need to mention this morning? All right. I'd like to invite you then to take your bulletin or turn your attention to the screen and to join with me as we open our service in prayer this morning. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you give us the joy of celebrating our Lord's resurrection. Give us also the joys of life in your service and bring us at last to the full joy of life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now I'd like to invite you to please stand and um, turn with me to number 889 in your hymnal or turn or look to the screen as we affirm our faith from number 889 this morning from 1 Timothy. I'll begin and then invite you to join with me. There is one God and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. Please be seated as our ushers come to receive our offering this morning. And as they come, let us be in a spirit of prayer. 
Oh Lord, we are so grateful for this day that you've given us. We are grateful for the opportunity to serve you, the opportunity to worship you, the opportunity to gather with friends and family as we gather in your house. And Lord, there are many things going on in the world around us, many things going on even in the life of our church. But Lord, what we know is that you are still on the throne, that you are still the one God who sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be our Lord and Savior. These are the things that we believe and cling to. And so, Lord, as we give you back a portion of what, we've, what you've given to us, we pray that you would bless these gifts, that others might know the good news of Jesus Christ through them. And it's these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. As we remain standing, let's join together in singing To God Be the Glory, hymn number 98.
Amen. Please be seated. As we come to a time of prayer in our service, there are a couple of folks I specifically want to uh, mention to you this morning. Um, let's see, I got a message that Donna Goodling, who is Kim Ballou's sister, will have a procedure on Tuesday, so please um, put her on your prayer list. Also, um, Cynthia Clark's mother is also in the hospital. I don't have her name, um, but um, we certainly want to pray for her. I saw Linda Moyers this week, and she is going to go into hospice care, so we would need to continue to pray for her and for her family. Also want to ask you to pray for our sister church here in Ruston, Trinity United Methodist Church, as they will be voting this afternoon, as well as will be Munholland United Methodist in Metairie down toward New Orleans. And so we want to remember those churches and our church and all other churches as they make some important decisions about their future um, coming in the coming weeks. And so, um, so please put that on your prayer list also. So are there others that you know of who are in need of our prayers this morning that you'd like to mention? Yes, sir. Ryan Sullivan. For Ryan Sullivan. Kevin. Yes. My daughter-in-law Jasmine's going into surgery this morning for a blood clot in the artery going to her left arm. Okay. So we want to pray for Jasmine. Okay. Others? Donna Collin. For Donna Collin. Collin. Okay. okay. Yes, ma'am. For Evangeline Wimberly. Hank Booth. For Hank Booth. Okay. All right, with those folks on our hearts and minds, let us pray together. Oh Lord, we are so grateful that we can gather in your house. There is a reason this place is called a sanctuary, because Lord, we, we need a safe place from a world that often seems upside down and crazy. Whenever we watch the news, whenever we hear of shootings here and there and other, where, other, where, other places, Lord, we, we know that this world is not as you designed it to be. But Lord, even while the world seems to be crumbling around us, we hold on to your hope, to your joy, to the grace and the peace that you grant to us. And so, Lord, as we hear your word from 1 Peter and think about those Christians who were being persecuted and yet they still held on to faith. They still said that there are things that we believe that we are still going to strive to be holy and to follow Jesus and to make a difference in our crazy and fallen world. Lord, we pray that you would help us to have the courage to follow their example, to cling closely to what we believe and to put it into practice in our hearts and lives. And Lord, as we gather together to worship this morning, we know that there is a world and we know that there are people in it who are hurting today. We have mentioned some of them, some that are in the hospital, others that are um, awaiting surgery, others that are in the healing process. And so Lord, we we ask your healing touch to be all of, upon all of those who are in need, especially our friends and family and those whom we have mentioned this morning. Lord, we also remember others who have lost a loved one to death or maybe are in that process. And Lord, we, we ask that your comfort, your peace that passes understanding would be with them. And Lord, as we gather in your house this morning, we may have other worries and concerns on our hearts and minds that we didn't mention Maybe it is about the future of our church or maybe other churches around us. But Lord, it may also be about friends or family or things at work or at school. Lord, whatever it is, what we know is that you have promised to never leave us or forsake us. And we depend upon your presence with us each and every day. And it is all these things we ask in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would the children come down for the children's sermon?
talk about believing. Um, hmm. Has anything ever happened to you and you said, I can't believe it? Like what? You think of anything? Uh, maybe there were some cookies in the kitchen and you went to get one and the brothers ate them all and you didn't get any? Did you say, I can't believe you ate all of them, did you? Maybe? Um, what about somebody promised to take you somewhere and the rain came and they couldn't take you somewhere? Did you say, I can't believe it, we can't go? You ever done that? Mm -hmm. Well, you know who is never going to let you down? Who's never gonna let you down? God, that's right. So today we're gonna talk about how we have hope in things like cookies, because they're good. And we have hope in things like going somewhere and doing something fun, but they're gonna let us down from time to time, aren't they? But you know who doesn't let us down? Who doesn't let us down? You just said it. God. God doesn't let us down no matter what. God's there. And you know, your mom and dad are pretty good about holding up to things too, aren't they? No. Okay, some things they can't help. But if, if they can't do it now, but they'll do it later, most of the time, Okay, sorry. I didn't mean to throw y'all under the bus this morning. Um, but God, God, we can always 100% count on, can't we? Even when things might not be exactly like we want, he's always going to do what he says, doesn't he? Isn't he? Okay? So remember that today. When sometimes you are, are guilty of saying, I can't believe that. Oh, don't ever say that about God because he can always do it. We can always believe in him. Okay? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for children, and we thank you for the honesty and the love that they have for you. And we um, ask that we would help our unbelieving when so many times we want to say, I don't believe it. But with you, we can believe everything. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. 
Amen. Thank you, choir. Well, last week we um, started a series out of the book of First Peter, um, talking about um, the the old the New Testament as we looked at Peter writing to um, to a people that were being persecuted and facing different trials of many kinds, and we talked about the ways that we can keep the joy of Easter even in the midst of trials, and so we. We'll look at 1 Peter for another couple of weeks, and today we come to 1 Peter chapter 1. I'll be reading from verses 13 to 25, and so I invite you to hear the word of the Lord this morning. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. There is a website titled IUsedToBelieve.com. You can actually visit it today. And it has over 75,000 things, entries of things that people like you and I submitted that we used to believe as children, but maybe know that they are not so correct anymore. So here's a few entries on that website related to faith. One, I used to believe that God was always watching me. I actually still believe that. So I danced around when I brushed my teeth so God would not get bored. I don't do that any longer, thank God. <laughs> I used to believe that God lived in the church. And the reason bad things happened was that God woke up grumpy from sleeping on the hard pews. I used to believe that communion was served during church because the service was so long that everybody needed a snack. I used to believe that God's name was Howard because we always pray, Our Father who art in heaven, Howard be thy name. At the end of the church service, our pastor always said, Go in peace, serve the Lord, to which the congregation would reply, Thanks be to God. I used to believe it was because we were all glad that the service was finally over. When I was younger, my mother told me that church was the house of God. For the longest time, whenever I went to church, I would wonder exactly which part of the church God lived in and why his house was so strange it didn't have any bedrooms or toys or anything like that. When I was young, I used to think that Presbyterians and pedestrians were the same thing. When my mom would drive by the hospital in our town, there was a sign that said, Pedestrian Crossing. And I always wondered why the Presbyterians got their own special crossing. So what can you say with confidence that you believe? Peter says to the early Christians, these Christians facing persecution at the hands of the Roman Emperor Nero. In verse 21, he writes to them, Through him, through Jesus, you believe in God 
who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. So what can we say we believe? And what does it mean for us in how we live? A few ideas for you this morning about this we believe. First, I would say that we believe that right is stronger than wrong. We believe that right is stronger than wrong. I heard about an old man who walked into his doctor's office and said, Doc, I've got to get a blood test. I'm about to get married. By the way, that has changed too. You don't have to get a blood test anymore to get married. And the doctor looked at him with admiration and said, Married? Just how old are you anyway? Oh, I'm only 92, the man replied. The doctor said, well, how old is your bride? He said, well, she's 20. The doctor said, only 20? You do understand that that kind of age, age disparity can be fatal. The old man just shrugged his shoulders and said, well, if she dies, she dies. <laughs> the mind is indeed a powerful and wonderful gift of God. And Peter understood the power of the mind and the importance of giving the mind the proper food and things to think on. That's why he says in verse 13, With minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. The things we think about matters. The things that we spend our time thinking on, the things that we put into our mind, those things matter. The word for mind in 1 Peter is the Greek word dianoia, which is actually a compound of two words that have been squished together. The word dia means through, and the word noia, from which we get knowledge from in the English language, literally means to think. So in that original Greek language, Peter is writing to those early Christians that there are some things that they need to think through about what they believe and how they live. There are things that we as Christians should be thinking through often. Things like the love and the mercy and the grace of God. I hope you heard Peter in, in one of his verses to him. He says, love one another deeply from the heart. Those are the kinds of things that we should be thinking through. Thinking through these things will help us face the trials, the temptations, and the troubles that daily life brings to us. So Peter says, if we get our mental act together, if we think on the right things, then our actions will follow. We need to fix our focus on the things that are really important. There was one bishop who served the Louisiana Annual Conference who said over and over again, keep the main thing the main thing. So we need to fix our focus on those things that really matter. So Peter is saying to us and to his early believers that we need to take our mind off of the troubles of this world and instead spend some time pondering about what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Now, it can be difficult to keep our minds off the troubles of this world. They seem to assault us on every occasion that all we have to do is turn on the television or open the newspaper or on the, turn on the radio and, and we can hear all about the troubles of the world. And that's not even to talk about what's going on with our friends and family and maybe even in the church. But Peter writes to those Christians, set your hope. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed in his coming. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is not in our country. Our hope is in Jesus. So we can believe the words of Jesus who said in John 16 verse 33, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Maybe we could even get to the point where we can practice the faith of a Holocaust victim who scribbled this on a cellar wall in Cologne, Germany. 
I believe in the sun even when it is not shining. I believe in love even when I am alone. I believe in God even when he is silent. And so we believe that love is stronger than hate. We believe that peace is better than war. The old hymn, This is My Father's World, says it this way. Though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. So we believe, first of all, that right is stronger than wrong. Secondly, we believe that Christ is the Savior of the world. We believe that Christ is the Savior of the world. This is what Peter writes in verses 18 through 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you are redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So Peter's talk about the redemptive power of the blood of Christ, and he calls him a lamb without spot or defect, slain for the forgiveness of sins, We may not understand that very well in today's world. In fact, it doesn't really make any sense at all without an understanding of the sacrificial systems of the Old Testament that the Jews practiced. The Jewish Talmud reports that over a million animals may have been sacrificed in one day in Jerusalem on the highest holy days. Priests were said to have stood in blood up to their knees. It was a bloody business, this sacrifice, and it is far removed from our experience in modern day. Truthfully, we don't really like thinking about all the blood that was shed. But blood is the very stuff of life. Without blood, you and I would die. That Sometimes folks can even die from a loss of blood. And one of the things that we can do to help others, which is so simple, is to give blood. I'm one of those universal donor types, and so they love, it. they love it when I come to give blood. I may never know the recipient's name or even why they are receiving the blood that I gave, but I give to help them live. Who knows that blood that took me 15 minutes to give could save someone else's life. And so we still sing with faith, with his blood he has saved us, with his power he will raise us, to God be the glory for the things he has done. It is through that blood of Jesus that we are redeemed. And this is what Paul writes. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition, from your fathers. Now we don't use that word redeemed very often today. When I was a kid, you could collect glass Coke bottles and redeem them for a few pennies. Some of you might remember the days when you could collect green stamps and redeem them for certain items. But the fact of the matter is there are a few things that we can redeem today. Most stores have even ended their layaway programs, and the layaway programs is you would say, well, I want this item, and I'm going to pay so much a month on this item, and then when it's paid off, you could take the item home. Most stores don't do that now. You can just put it on your credit card and pay it off year, week after week or month after month or even year after year if you want. But in New Testament times, the word redeemed meant to set a slave free by the payment of a ransom. Slaves were common in the New Testament, and you could literally buy your freedom if you could save enough money. In fact, some scholars believe that 40% of the people in the Roman Empire were slaves. Maybe some of the believers that Peter was writing to were slaves, or maybe they were freed slaves. They were, they knew what it was like to be slaves. They knew what it was like to be redeemed. And every believer is in effect a freed slave. But notice Peter says that we have been freed from an empty way of life. Salvation not only gives us a place in heaven, it gives us a purpose while we are on this earth. 
I heard about a couple from the country who decided to go into the big city and see all of the attractions there. Well, it just happened to be the the week when the county fair was in town. They only had a few dollars and they went into the fair and they spent almost all of their money on some trinkets and gadgets. Well, they had 15 cents left and the old farmer saw a carousel, a merry-go-round, He wanted to ride it, but his wife didn't want him to. But he decided he was going to ride it anyway. So he paid his 15 cents, all the money he had left. He got on the merry-go-round and he went round and round and round and round. And when when it stopped, he got off. His wife said, now just look at you. Look at what you've done. You spent all your money. You got on the merry-go-round. You went round and round and round, and you got off exactly where you got on, and you ain't been nowhere. That is exactly how the vast majority of people in this life are living. Life for them is a merry-go-round that they're just going from one day to the next. They're not trying to get anywhere in particular. They are going to get off where they got on without ever having been anywhere. Without Jesus, there is no purpose in life. But with Jesus, there is no life without purpose. Without Jesus, there is no purpose in life. But with Jesus, there is no life without purpose. We have been redeemed not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. You cannot buy your salvation with Coke bottles or green stamps or money or marbles or chocolate. It has already been bought. It has already been paid for. You cannot buy it with tithes or offerings. You cannot buy it with church attendance, even though I love to see you in the pews. You cannot buy it with clean living. The price has already been paid. Jesus has paid it all. All to him we owe. We believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. The last thing I want you to see is we believe that faith should make a difference in how we live. We believe that faith should make a difference in how we live. So this is what Peter writes. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. I hope you notice that he used that word holy four times in just two verses. When I'm reading the Bible, I'm always looking for repeated words, phrases, and and ideas because to me that's some indication of what the author of what God is trying to say. So Paul writes to them saying, don't be conformed to the world. Instead, be more like God. His character can be described by one word, holy. Now, holiness is not a popular subject today. The world makes fun of it. They'll call you a holy roller. And if you aren't careful, they'll say you have a holier-than-thou kind of attitude. But holiness is an imperative. This is the command that Peter writes, right? Be holy because God is holy. The word holy means to be separate, to be set apart, to be reserved for a special purpose. That is what we should be. Our mouth, our mind, our money, our morals should all belong to God. What we say, what we do, what we drink, where we go, what we read, who we associate with, what we look at on the internet, all of that belongs to God. Peter also says that there is a reason that we should be holy. He tells his readers that they should be obedient children. You see, there are several reasons we can obey others. A slave obeys his master because he has to. An employee obeys his boss in order to keep his job. But a son obeys his father because he loves him. As children, we are to be conformed to the character of our father, not to this world. We should be 
holy. It was John Wesley's deep conviction that all Christians, especially the Methodist, were called to live a holy life and to spread scriptural holiness throughout the land. The very first name, Methodist, was intended to be derisive and a put-down. Before the group was called Methodist, they were called the Holy Club. The Holy Club consisted of John, his brother Charles, who wrote many of the hymns in our hymnal, and a few others who met together regularly several times a week. They fasted together, they studied the scriptures, and then they would go out and serve others. The name Methodist was first used of John and Charles Wesley and was meant to ridicule that group because they were so methodical in their approach to studying scripture and living a holy life. But the truth is that holiness is not just for Methodists. It should be for all believers. Peter writes in verse 15, Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. Holiness is not some super achievement. We don't get a badge for holiness or we don't get a crown above our head that says I'm holy. But holiness is, should be for every believer as we strive and seek to follow Jesus each and every day. I heard about a child who was describing that he was about to enter first grade that very fall. And, and then he said, after that, I will be in second grade, and then in third grade, and then in fourth grade, and then in fifth grade. And, and with a mild panic on his face, he exclaimed, I have a really, really long way to go. That's how I feel about holiness. I have a long way to go. But Peter writes to his readers, be holy, for God is holy. I have never been more serious about living a Christian life and doing the will of God than I am today. I am sure the same is true for many of you. So we believe that faith should make a difference in how we live. And so I'd like to invite you to consider carefully what you believe and why. I'd like to invite you to live out our faith through the things that we do and say. Not because we are better, but because of what Jesus did for us. Peter writes in verse 23, We have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. We have new life. Because of what Jesus has done for us. We have new life because we believe. So what we believe, what we think through, what we think about really matters. We believe that faith makes a difference in our lives. We believe that Christ is the Savior. We believe that right is stronger than wrong. This is what we believe. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, we are so grateful for all that you have done for us through the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would help us to think about what we believe and not only think about, but to live it out in the way that we live. For, Lord, we do believe that what we say on Sunday should make a difference in how we live on Monday. We pray that you would help us to be the kind of believers that others will see Jesus in us and will come to know his grace, his mercy, and his love. Lord, we are so thankful for the gift that you have sent us in Jesus Christ that it's not something we can buy with money or silver or gold or redeem for Coke bottles or green stamps. But Lord, the gift that he has given us is much greater, that he gave us his very life so that we might know life. And Lord, we give you thanks for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we know that even though this world seems upside down, we know that you are still working in it. We know that you are still calling us to make a difference in this world. And so, Lord, even in the midst of a crazy world, what we believe is that right is stronger than wrong. And so, Lord, help us to live out our faith in a way that brings glory to you. And it's all these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. As we come to a time of response in our service,
The altar is open if you would like to come and pray. I'll be glad to pray with you if you'd like for me to do so. I'd also be glad to talk with you if you'd like to know more about trusting in Christ as your Lord and Savior or to become a member of our church as we follow him. I guess I have lost the um, bulletin. But we're going to sing um, Lamb of God to close. And I know this is maybe kind of a new one. Ah, thank you. Um, so the choir is going to kind of lead us. And as you catch on, then I invite you to join with them. But I think you'll find the words meaningful as we think about what God has done for us. Would you stand as we sing together? Thank you for being here today. I do want to remind you as you leave that the new upper rooms from May and June are available for you, as well as the discernment team's report if you're interested in reading that. And we'll have um, some more time over the next couple of weeks as we prepare for our church conference. But I want to invite you as you leave to think about what we believe and what it matters to the way in which we live. And so let us close in prayer. Oh, Lord, we are so grateful for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We are so grateful that his life makes a difference in the way in which we live. Lord, as we think about what we believe and what it means to us, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be holy, to be set apart, to be living lives for you so that others can see you and what we do and what we say. And so, Lord, as we depart from this place into our week, into a week that is full of challenges, we pray that you would go with us and that others would see Jesus in us through the things that we do and say. And it's these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Amen.